My name is Ben Gashason. I'm the executive director of Power Initiative Nigeria and I'm a game changer. I was born in Akure in Ondo State um, to amazing parents. Uh, my dad is a retired teacher and my mom is a retired nurse, so they were in the civil service. And that would give you, you know, an idea of um, what kind of family I was born into. We didn't, we didn't have a lot, but we didn't know we didn't have a lot. Uh, so that was, that was probably the first foundation I had in life. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know to measure life in terms of what we had or did not have. I need to measure life in terms of what I could become. And I think one of the first fundamental you know, principles was my dad talking to me about IS mark obtainable. Um, I would come home with 99% and first position in mathematics and he would ask me, okay, so this is 99, you're first. You're first amongst X number of students. Um, how come you did not score 100? And I would look at him like, what does that mean? I'm first. And he then explained the difference between coming first among the, you know, amongst a group. You could be first and score 39, but scoring 100 meant to score the highest mark obtainable and, and and i think that laid the foundation for me in terms of measuring myself never against people but against the best that i can be and um my my career decision was was very simple um because my dad was a teacher my mom was in, you know, in the medical uh, services industry uh, there were two different things they were looking at my dad was looking at engineering my mom was looking at medicine for obvious reasons um, and I think at the time also, um, so I, I was in secondary school in, in the early 90s and anybody who was seen as brilliant was supposed to go and study medicine for some reason, um, which we now know, uh, thank God all of us did not study medicine because we would be in much more trouble right now if everybody had just one career. So I basically uh, fell in love with engineering at some point. Uh, but. The fact that I don't even practice core engineering today uh, is very much related to my experience in my third year in, in secondary school in FGC Doani. Um, I, I, the school got some computers and I wanted to go and learn how to use them because I knew that, you know, I'd heard my friends, one of them come back to class and say, oh, he played games on the computer. And I knew the computers were important, not because I knew what they were, but because the principal went to the gate of the school to welcome the truck that brought these two boxes. You know, we didn't know what they were. Uh, they were, you know, like a television screen and a video player and a keyboard. And so we found out it was called computers. Uh, they were called computers and it was a big deal to touch them. So I wanted to go and touch them and I got to the door of the computer lab, which interested enough was like the second half of the principal's office. And if anybody knows secondary schools in Nigeria, you know that the principal's office is a no-go area. So imagine a no-go area in a no-go area. It was like the, the in fact, the untouchable section of, of the school. But I got there, and I was 13 or so, and I went there and I said to them, uh, 12 or 13, I, you know, and I said, well, I, I would like to go use the computers. And he literally, you know, the teacher literally looked down at me and said, uh, there are no people like you, you can't understand how to use them. And um, like any 12, 13 year old would do, I cried. Uh, of course, I didn't cry all the way back to class because there were girls in my class. And in GS3, girls didn't, they could never know that boys, you know, cried. Uh, but, but it was internalized. And, and what I decided to do at the time was to learn how to use computers um, and also to teach other people. And that was basically to, you know, get back at that teacher. And guess what? That, that formed the basis of my career today because that's the major reason why I went out of my way to learn how to use computers and to begin to teach people. And which I've now found out, you know, you can actually build a career around it. So at the time, I didn't know you could build a career around it. I thought you could only be a doctor or, you know, an engineer or an accountant or a lawyer. Uh, at that time, it was, everything was either professional or you were not serious. Uh, but right now, I know that you can build a career around this and, and I'm, I'm loving it. So, um, it's difficult for me to talk about achievements. Um, one of the things I tell people is that you can never put the tag achievement on anything you do because other people, it's other people's job to do that. Um, what you can do is become the best you can be and others would have to target either an achievement or a mediocre thing you did or not. But if there's one, uh, speaking specifically you know, about awards now, if there's one, actually I'll say two. Um, 
you know, it'll have to be one A and one B. Uh, two, two, two awards that actually, you know, uh, mean a lot to me uh, and for their significant reasons. The first was uh, my, the first award I, I, I got, it wasn't the first, but it was the first major award I got in 2002 uh, when I became Nigeria's IT Youth Ambassador. Uh, not only because the person who handed the plaque to me was Walesho Inka, who at that time I'd only seen in my dad's library, because my dad studied English and history, uh, but because it was the first time that in the country where I grew up, you know, I grew up in Nigeria and I always knew people were getting awards for either being, you know, great singers or being, particularly being great sports people. I'd never heard about anybody getting an award, a national award or becoming an ambassador because, you know, they were great at, you know, computers or anything like that. So it was, it was important to me that um, I, was, I was recognized and I was, I mean, all over the news it was, it was I was called this whiz kid and all that, even though I didn't like the kid part of it because I was already 24. Uh, so, you know, that, that didn't help. Uh, that's, that's one that, you know, means a lot to me. Uh, it's the heaviest of all the plaques I have, uh, and I think they made it, you know, heavy that way so that I would never forget. The other one uh, that means a lot to me, interesting enough, is the most, uh, is, well, not the most recent, but one of the most recent uh, that I got from, from Schwab Foundation as uh, a Social Entrepreneur of the Year. And the reason that is important is because while the first one was for me as an individual, this one was for the institution of Paradigm Initiative Nigeria. Um, one of the things I made up my mind to do when I started you know, this organization was that I would never run this organization the way we usually run organizations. It's about one person, it's gonna be about one person, it's always gonna be about one person. I wanted to build a brand that would survive you know, even beyond my own existence. And, and so it was great for me to see there was global recognition for the work that we do, uh, and not just as Ben Gashesson now, but as part of Initiative Nigeria. Um, now that I say this, I'm, I'm remembering my, my Ashoka Award, which was the first time anybody would say to me that, you know what, you're doing a great job, so don't think about money. We'll give you money for three years every month. Uh, I'm not the unit. We'll give you for three uh, for three years, and then we'll introduce you to the rest of the world. So uh, it will be one of those three. It will be my uh, ICB Ambassador Award, and um, Ashoka Award, and the Schwab uh, Foundation recognition. So one somewhere within those three recognitions is what I would what I would consider the you know one of the biggest encouragements I've had uh, so far. Okay, so uh, my my career started basically, uh, you know, after I had the trigger in, in GS3, I completely forgot about it, and then I got into IFE, and um, I got into IFE to study to study engineering, and by my fourth year, I had a chance to go to uh, to go for industrial attachment. So t sometime before that period. I started getting a lot, you know, interested in computers because if I just got internet access and, you know, come on, who would not want to go online? Uh, but I, I went to work with a man called James Shotomi, Dr. James Shotomi of blessed memory. Um, he returned from the UK. Uh, he was working on neural networks, uh, training computers to do various things that I thought were magic at the time. And he returned to Nigeria to set up a company called Neural Technologies Limited. And um, so I joined him for my industrial attachment, which was kind of not the thing that many people did in, in kind of my fourth year, because people went to the big companies to earn a lot of money, come back to school and you know uh, enjoy the money and all, and probably get a chance to work for that company later. Uh, but I I saw him as an opportunity to learn, you know, to reconnect with with the dream I had about computing. And the interesting, you know, interesting thing is I learned how to use computers a lot more there. Um, I got connected uh, to the internet. I learned how to use, um, you know, I learned how to design websites actually. He gave me, I remember he gave me a manual to learn HTML. So that was sort of the beginning uh, for me. And um, I returned to school and I think that the real beginning was that after I got back to school. So before I went to school, I told him, uh, Dr. Chitomi, you know what? Um, now you're not going to pay me anymore, but please don't fire me, you know, don't let me go. Uh, let me stay not on your payroll, but on the organization's uh, list. 
I will work for you. I want to work all through my stay in school. Don't pay me. But if you have any work you want to do anywhere around my university, you know, somewhere around Ife, Ibadan, Akure, let me go on behalf of the company. And that was interesting because I think I mean, anybody would gladly say yes to a young man who wanted to work for free. So I continue to work for Nira Technologies Limited. Uh, and I, I remember, you know, visiting some people in Ife on behalf of the company. So when I got back to school, I organized with a friend of mine called Ogim DK. We put together what we called at the time WPD 2000. In fact, I sent him the manual that I used to learn HTML uh, before I finished my industrial attachment and told him, study this, we need to make money from it. Uh, before then, of course, uh, I was your regular student who didn't exactly, you know, uh, spend enough money because it was only, you know, what my parents gave me. But we did this training. We had, um, we had 12 people sign up. They paid 2000 naira each. That was a lot of money, you know, at, at that time. And the interesting thing is that the money we got from that, we used to get accommodation and then we used to, you know, uh, lay foundation for some business that we did, which was to convert yearbooks into year CDs. And of course, uh, we lived a better life uh, as students. So I would say this, this was the beginning uh, of the tech side of my work. And um, going on, I, I, I got a lot more interest in, because I made a promise myself uh, to myself in my third year in secondary school that I was going to teach others. Uh, so I wasn't going to do it only because I wanted to make money from, you know, from training them. I got a lot, of, you know, a lot more interested in training people who could not afford to pay. Uh, and that was, that was why I chose to work with Junior Achievement of Nigeria. Um, well, I wanted to work with them for one year uh, for my NYC period. But that became you know, six years, and that laid a very, very strong foundation for my interest in the non-profit sector in Nigeria. So that's that's basically you know where tech met with development and, uh, and formed the basis for the career that I run today. Every career success is built on, on dangerous decisions. Um, I remember a friend of mine tells a story of how somebody promised to work on water and told his colleagues he would work on water and all of them were worried. And then one day he took them to Riverside and walked on water and they were like, how did you do it? And he apparently, when he was telling them he was going to walk on water, every day he had gone to the river to throw stones into it. And so he laid a path for himself with stones and all he had to do to walk on water was to walk on, to know where the stones were. And so for, for, for me and for anyone who will achieve, you know, um, some level of being able to do what they plan to do, you need to throw out some very weird stones and find out where they are. And, and I think that two or three, three of the stones that I had to throw that were not comfortable, um, number one was the fact that I was studying electrical and electrical engineering but I wanted to do things around computing. So I needed to make a decision within the academic space on choosing a final year project that would be relevant to my career. Um, now, this was not something that was popular in 1999-2000, uh, which was about the time I was going to select my topic in 2000. You normally had to go to the, you know, to the list and you would check what the lecturers wanted you to do. But I decided not to do that. I walked up to a lecturer, Professor uh, Pule Kendi, and said, this is the project I want to work on. And for some reason, he agreed. Uh, it was you know, a, a great lecture. Um, and um, for, you know, um, the department, interesting enough, um, set the date for the, for the final year project defense. And when it was my turn, I basically I, I brought in a computer because my, my topic was on e-commerce and on local area network and Java, which were definitely interesting topics for an electronic and electrical engineering student. And I remember the warning that I got uh, from one of the lecturers was simple. If you want to graduate, change your topic, because this is for computer science students, you're in elect select. But I made that decision to do it. Um, the lecturer kind of graded me very low, um, which of course affected my, my results. Thankfully, uh, Professor Kende's result was also good, which made it really great. So for some reason, because between that and some other decisions I made, I ended up with an extra semester 
and with um, I graduated with a second class lower, which meant I didn't meet my target academically, but I had to choose. I had, you know, to choose between two. Um, of course, I also spent too much time, you know, on things I probably shouldn't have spent time on. So it is possible for a student to graduate with a class of degree and with the career of their dreams. But for me, by the time it was too late, I had to choose one of both, and I and, and I chose my career. And that wasn't a very popular decision at the time. That was that was one. The second was also in terms of choosing where to work. So I studied electrical and electrical engineering from Oxford University, and for for the mere fact that I was in IFE, uh, there were certain organisations um, that that took students from my department uh, because you know they had a relationship. But I made a choice to work for a non-profit. I was going to earn, I think, about twenty-five percent of what my colleagues were earning at the time. Um, I chose to work with Junior Achievement of Nigeria. The reason for that was very simple. In the future, I wanted to build an organization that would solve problems within the Nigerian social space. It meant that I couldn't afford to go and work in an organization that just paid me a salary and had no connection with social services. So I had to choose junior achievement. In making that choice, I earned much less. Um, I probably had, you know, uh, much less than my colleagues in the first six years of my career because I worked in junior achievement. Uh, junior achievement did their best, but everyone knows, of course, nonprofits don't pay as well um, as as many other organisations. And that was one decision that I made that, of course, I have no regrets about, but I'm sure was not something that uh, was an easy decision for me to make. And and the third one was in terms of um, you know, yes, I was a junior achievement, but I worked there Mondays to Friday. And then what I did was every weekend, so I earned not a lot at the time, not a lot, uh, I don't want to put numbers to it, because even when I think of the numbers now, I don't laugh, my face just goes stiff. Um, and what, what I did was every weekend, I spent time with students in one tertiary institution in Nigeria or the other, training them on how to use computers. Now that was not convenient at all. Unfortunately, it meant I was almost always broke, Unfortunately, it meant that I had no social life. Unfortunately, it meant that many other things in my life had to be deferred. But one thing was sure, I was laying a foundation for what would become Paradigm Initiative Nigeria. I was laying a foundation, and I had a theory at the time. My theory was personal development, nation building, regional cooperation, and global participation. And it was very simple, four stages. I developed myself uh, before I left school. And when I left school, the next step was I had to, you know, contribute to my country. And I did that by going to different schools, you know, accepting invitations and all that. And, of course, the next natural level was for me to start doing things across the continent before I could have a global career that, you know, that I, that I run today. And so those are some of the things that, you know, looking back, I, I, I'm not too sure that there were, you know, things I did with ease, but I have no regrets that I did that. So I'll say to every young person that wants to quit, go ahead and quit. But when you quit, remember this, you're a failure two times over. You failed because you quit, and you failed because you would never know if you would succeed in the first place. And that's why I say to young people, if you want to quit, just go ahead and quit. But if you, like me, want to have a life that will not be full of regrets, and you will look back and be able to say, you know what, I had fun. Because it's stress to live in Nigeria. It's stress if you live in some certain cities that, you know, across Nigeria. So you don't want to add the stress of not having a fulfilled life with it. And the three things that I always hold on to, number one, passion. What are you passionate about? Whatever you are passionate about should form the core of your career. There are jobs I didn't take because they had nothing to do with my passion. While I worked at Junior Achievement, I got offers that were, in fact, I got an offer to a consulting firm that had denied me access to their, you know, to their test when I was in school because I had a 2-2, they wanted only 2-1, and then they eventually invited me and they were going to add on to, you know, to get me to work with them. Wonderful salary, wonderful environment and all that, but I said no. And my boss at the time, you know, uh, Mrs. Osayo Rene, was even laughing at me and saying, you know, now, well, you know, how could you reject such an offer? But the reason was very simple. 
where I was going and where I am going is very different from what they were offering, even though it was lucrative. Make sure that everything you do takes you closer to your passion. The second is in terms of, you know, skills. Um, they say there are no jobs in Nigeria, but I say to young people who care to listen, there are jobs, there are just no skills. Every day I know of positions, every week I get messages from people who need people who do specific things. 10,000 hour principle. What is that one thing you are willing to invest 10,000 hours in such that you become the expert at it? When I was 24, I made up my mind that before I turn 40, I want to become the best at something in Nigeria. ICT is for development such that if they were going to list three people that must be on the table when they discuss that topic, I will be there. I've got three and a half years to go to get to that place. Is it three and a half years or two? I think I'm getting really old. <laughs> I've got, I've got, you know, about three years to get there, and I'm on the journey. And that is a promise I've made to myself. I'm either the best or nothing. And I think that everyone's telling themselves, you know, that invest in yourself, develop skills. You are either the best or nothing. When whatever you do doesn't matter, just become the best at it. There are people today who are invited across the world simply because they know one thing and the world wants to listen to it. That's the second thing. And the third thing is in terms of value. Whatever you do, find the value in it. The value that you get and the value that you give. Those three things guide my entire life. Passion, if I'm disconnecting my passion, I will suffer. Skills, if I don't add new skills to myself, as a matter of fact, I update my CV every quarter. I'm not looking for a job. I've never looked for a job since 2001, but I update my CV for one simple reason. The day that my skills become blunt, I'm as good as dead. And the third is value. Passion, skills, and value. Master them and enjoy your life.